everything we've done today. I just want to say this is my third World Beyond War conference and everyone I've gone to um, has been such a rewarding experience. I really want to say there's no place in the world I'd rather be than right here today and no, no people I'd rather be with than a large room full of people who, who really believe that we can end war. Um, just a couple of short announcements. We are having a film tonight at 8.30, Soldiers Without Guns. Um, and that's the last event for today. Then tomorrow is another busy day, ending in an um, exciting event at Shannon Airport. Hopefully it will be exciting for Shannon Airport as well as for us. Um, and I wanted to mention this book. I think everybody here knows what this book is. Whether or not you have the hard copy, you can download the whole thing for free. This is a very important book. It basically is the work of several people who put their heads together to figure out what it means to, to seriously change the world and, and end the disease of war. And that's what this book is about. Um, and you can download it for free. Just go to our website and you'll find it there. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm yes. sorry. I'm sorry. Did I get it wrong? Okay. Yes, you're correct. I had it. So it's not that dumb, but okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to call up somebody from each, a, a designated one or two people from each workshop, and you're just going to talk a little bit about what you did. And I think we should spend maybe um, seven or seven minutes or so, and that and that'll. Um, That'll let us finish on time, and then we can actually have dinner and stuff like that. <laughs> so first, I'm going to call up from um, group number one, Divestment 101, with Greta Zaro, Anna O'Gorman, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, and Thoman Sweet. Um, who are the designated uh, reporters from that? <laughs> Seven minutes? Is that too long or too long? Way, way too long. <laughs> um, yeah. I think they picked the person least qualified, but didn't speak, speak up against it. At any rate, we have two wonderful presenters, and uh, I tell you, this has to be uh, so important in terms of success. You hit people where most people <coughs> care the most in their pocketbook. But to do so in a way that creates success, it's important to, there are three things, the vision, the aim, the strategy. So what is the vision? What do you really want to do? And then how will you accomplish it? That's the, that's the aim. And then the strategy, there are all kinds of strategies. Dealing with people who are more or less supportive, who are neutral, who are against, you have to figure it out and take care to, uh, to approach people with the minimum amount of uh, force, I would say. So the doctors, you know, you have something, you minimum, you don't know, amputate the leg first, you do a lot of different, a lot of different things. But um, uh, at, at the last, someone suggested a very uh, helpful piece of information. Actually, it sounds like you're, you're many pieces of information here. It's somewhat older, but it's called Movement Action Plan by Bill Moyer that you can check out on, on the web somewhere that it, that it shows how, how groups can really be successful in doing whatever they want to do. So we focused on uh, talking about, well, where do, where do we get? Uh, and of course, when you're talking about divestment, it's the, uh, the, the, the schools or the cities or the churches, the, the pension plans where people have put money and you need to figure out exactly where they um, get the information, where are they investing, what do they need uh, 
to where is the divestment focus needed and uh, take it take it from there. I, I thought this is probably not that this reminded me of something from years ago when we were talking about how you do something. This is in, an inappropriate analogy for a world beyond war conference, but ready aim fire. When you uh, you reverse that, if you fire before you aim or you're ready, you kind of mess up. So the idea here is the preparedness, which is the part of the vision. The, the aim, you really need to be careful before you, as I said, it's inappropriate, before you pull the trigger. Because uh, that's, that's how you get effectiveness and have uh, the best impact. So that's, I, I need you of my remaining four minutes to uh, anyone else on LinkedIn who was a part of that strategy want to say something that I didn't say. All right. Somebody will run over. <laughs> I'm just thinking maybe a better metaphor would be like ready, aim, throw, like a football or something like that. Um, then we can aim without shooting anyone. Um, okay, um, number two, youth activism and peace in schools with Luke Addison, Vijay, and Matej Moles. Um, again, not sure if I said that name right. Come on up. Thank you. Yeah, but they had to go early, taking a train back somewhere. So I will report on what he said and what I said. So I started off by asking some uh, questions from the, from the audience, which I call test your knowledge of peace. So I'm not going to ask test your knowledge of peace, but it was the questions were like how many countries have a government department for peace? How much US how much was the global military spending? Yeah? With a population of three hundred million, how many guns US have? Mm. These kind of questions. Or and some climate change questions like what is the carbon footprint emission of CO2 emissions of one B2 bomber uh, uh, bomber mission? And then how many countries recently voted to ban nuclear weapons? And name a 20th century conflict which has been resolved. Or how many countries uh, recently voted to ban nuclear weapons? And how many countries U.S. has got bases? And how many countries our own U.K. is supplying weapons to? And things like that. Then I went on to the solutions and actions of what youth activism or activists should do, like joining a peace group, attending a peace rally like tomorrow, inviting a peace speaker to your event, workplace or community, studying non-violence, conflict resolutions, getting in touch with your member of parliament or congressman or whoever and ask them the relevant questions about peace and disarmament and about anti-war and why they are not doing something or ask them to uh, request them to ask questions in the parliament about, about our issues whatever the, yeah, and then creating music, art, painting uh, with the themes of peace and, and then, of course, uh, spreading kindness, fairness, compassion, justice, equality, freedom. But the values which underpin a good society has been all this hatred and all this divisive nature of society all over the world. We do need that. And then I started explaining that why do we need peaceful schools or why do we need peace in the schools? And the most important reason is when the minds are raw, like even six-year-old, five-year-old, four-year-old, we should start telling them about peace. And if the hope is we won't have leaders like Trump in future. 
or we wouldn't have little like leaders like Boris Johnson. We wouldn't have our mongers, our future leaders. So if you inculcate peace in the young minds, and they can become not only peace activists, they can become peace ambassadors all around the world, wherever they go or whatever profession they are in. And so the peace need to be. Uh, we need to have peaceful schools or peace education in primary, secondary, universities, etc., etc. So, and then I, I spoke that at this moment there is an untapped resource, or you can call energy, of 1.8 billion young people, which need empowerment to actively involve in organizations, civic initiatives and activities and peace building. Then I gave some examples from the old, like Gandhi's non-violence Indian independence movement, Martha Luther, Luther King's civil rights movement, and how he got the votes for the black people, and Nelson Mandela, and then today's activists like Malala Yousafzai, the Pakistani activist for female education, and Greta Thunberg, which have been talked a lot, the Swedish teen, climate change activists. In, in short, young people have a very powerful voice and overpowering will to change the future. That was my workshop, just a resume. Mate provided completely some, something different, an over, a overview of how social media, especially Instagram, and how they can be used in youth activism and youth mobilization. And he uh, emphasized <coughs> the importance of hashtag in order to assure your posts go viral. Because the, the post, everyone's, if they got hashtag account, everyone has got two to five hundred followers, but how can we make it to millions of followers? So two things uh, uh, is that it needs to resonate with people's passions. So if you can do it in a, uh, that way, it will resonate with the public. And he gave examples of sea legacy, if people would like to see, and about a 14-year-old girl whom he met in Glasgow, and all week she used to go to school on Friday and Saturday. Uh, she was running a campaign called Futures, futures for Friday. So, again, highlighting the climate change crisis and how we can come overcome it. And, uh, and that was, in, in, in short, crux of uh, Mathieu's uh, uh, emphasis, which was on social media. And he said, he gave the, again and again, the, he said about the importance of having a hashtag. Like in this conference, we have a hashtag, haven't we? For sure, it's right on the wall. Yeah, we have a hashtag in the world beyond the So, if you can have a successful hashtag, and he gave me different examples, how can you have uh, hashtags which can go viral or which can convey your message. And also, a question was asked of him and me, can serious issues uh, can be discussed on Instagram and others? And Mine and uh, Matei's answer was, sure, it can, as long as you put them into story form, or as long as you got a very compelling picture to go with it, and a small caption, they can go viral. I think that is a, the crux of our youth activism and peace in schools workshop. Thank you. Um, um. The subject of hashtags is close to my heart, so um, I, I also want to say that um, I totally agree that you can have serious conversations using hashtags. We've been doing it on World Beyond War for, for years, and, um, and that is our hashtag, No War 2019. You can use that to give feedback. You can use that to tell us something that you don't agree with. Um, we want everybody... If, we want everybody who has anything to say about this conference to let us know. This is actually a way, like an evaluation form, 
that you can actually give us feedback about how we're doing by posting about it. And um, I think it can be a, a, a really vigorous conversation. I'd like every single person in this room to be, to be um, using social media to interact with us if you'd like. And by the way, hashtags are not just Twitter. Hashtags are for Facebook, Instagram. Um, and and when, you, when you use our hashtag, which is for this conference, No War 2019, otherwise World Beyond War, um, we will see it, and it's a way for you to connect with us, and it's a way for us to connect with you. So please do. And, and please don't hesitate to be serious on social media. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, um, number three, creating a culture of celebrating peace with Liz, Remiswal Hughes, and David Swanson. And who is your designated It's reporter? me, I'm right oh, here. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, David and uh, Liz really led us, uh, not by giving a presentation, but uh, by creating a, a workshop where we're all participated in brainstorming for ideas for creating a culture of celebrating peace. Um, so we talked about a really wide range of ideas um, and it, it was from a lot of different countries. Um, uh, in, in various places and things that, that we were doing locally and, and uh, as well as uh, more um, international things. So we talked, um, one of the things we talked about for quite a while um, was the war monuments that exist and are practically ubiquitous everywhere and um, thinking of how to change monuments or create other monuments and one of the things that we thought about was what what peace monuments are there and so people were giving various examples um, we even passed around a picture uh, a photo of the huge peace monument in North Korea which is women's hands coming together um, sort of in a big big arch um, we talked about um, uh, other possibilities like contests around um, uh, essays or our art on peace, peace museums, um, creating or, or helping to create official cultural commissions of peace uh, in municipalities. Um, we talked about um, uh, Esperanto as the language of peace and a way to bring that into to celebrating peace. Um, and we also talked uh, quite a bit about International uh, Peace Day and activities around that. There was um, someone described uh, Peace Week in the state of Arkansas and the U.S. Um, that's been going for several years and activities that are built around that. Um, and then we focused a bit, uh, David was trying to <laughs> bring us to um, perhaps focus on one idea around celebrating the culture of peace and to actually develop some strategies about that. Uh, we didn't we didn't quite get there, but um, the one we talked about most specifically um, is that of uh, Armistice Day. Um, in the U.S., Armistice Day um, has, uh, which was established in 1918, um, after World War II, you know, morphed into Veterans Day. And so it's become yet another way to uh, glorify war and um, uh, the war dead, as, as someone said, we should really um, try to change the language um, to make it clear that it's not Veterans Day, it's Veterans for War Day. Um, so we talked about a couple specific um, efforts that are being made to create Armistice Day again, either to revise it revive it to replace Veterans Day, 
um, again, in local areas or, you know, whether that requires a, sort of a, a whole new day. Um, also talked about a number of ways to um, highlight and focus on peace individuals who are heroes around peace, um, changing symbols, uh, peace acknowledgments. Um, yeah, and, I, and I, I think that I will end there, but I'll ask if anyone in that group would like to add anything that is important that I may have forgotten. Yeah. We spoke about peace poets. Oh, yes. Peace, peace, peace poets. And it was not just to, cre to celebrate the peace culture, it's to create a peace culture because we live in a war system. So we need to create something anew. Thank you. Anybody else have a good addition? Okay. Oh, yes. Loving for peace. Pardon me? Oh, yes. The, one of the other ideas um, that Angie suggested was using laughter yoga to um, <laughs> actually bring people together uh, because what did you say? Laughter is the shortest distance between people. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up, activism to end the war on Afghanistan with Brian Terrell and Hakeem Young. Um, who is the... Great. Hello. Um, okay, so we uh, were about 16 people and we formed a sharing circle where we were... Um, we, yeah, where we had three types of questions uh, with the focus or like with the aim to change our ways of thinking or broaden our ways of thinking. So we, the first one was uh, critical thinking skills and um, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that these three skills are used in the Afghan Peace Volunteers organization in Afghanistan and so we were practicing them in our um, group work. So uh, the first question was, uh, if uh, the US military withdraws completely from Afghanistan, uh, the Taliban or ISIS will take control? Well, this was more of a statement. So uh, we broke off into smaller groups and discussed. And of course, none of us had the answer to whether that's true or not. But we had to uh, like look um, for uh, some truth, uh, not truth, but result, uh, if that happened, would it happen, and uh, yeah, it just caused a discussion and there was no, uh, we don't know if that would happen. Um, okay, and then the second question um, was creative thinking skills, uh, where um, the question was, what creative solutions can you think of in the Afghan war? So we, um, the yeah, we were talking in small groups for about five minutes, and uh, some good uh, uh, ideas were bringing the different sides of the fight to the table to talk. Um, reparations in Afghanistan from countries uh, who are not involved in the war. Um, yeah. Um, then, what else did we talk about? Um, the last question was relational, uh, yeah, relational thinking skills, which um, should, which are used to learn by relating with nature and every person involved in conflict, um, and connect all the dots within a conflict. So the climate change, inequality, and war. Um, Hakim shared a personal story of a friend and farmer he knows in Afghanistan. And then the question was, how can we apply relational thinking skills to the Afghan and global refugee and, refu and the global refugee system? So uh, lots of interesting points came up here. 
and um, thought maybe the ecosystem in Afghanistan would regrow if the U.S. backed out of the war, and uh, maybe uh, that would lead to Afghanis wanting to go back. Um, yeah, and. Then the conclusion from Hakim was that the current way we humans are thinking is not working and we need new ones. So that, that was uh, the reason for the three different thought patterns and skills. And then Brian, um, Kate, we had an exercise with Brian that was uh, a question after, yeah, a question, what are the connections to the perpetrators in our community? which we discussed as a big group. And um, the main thing that I took down from that was whether to shame the perpetuators or whether to um, educate and open the dialogue with them. Like, so whether to, yeah, to put them into prison and to like take their job away from them if uh, they, or whether to, to open a dialogue and to try and change things in a more peaceful way. Um, yeah, and um, uh, yeah, that's all, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone in the group wants to share in there. All right, you covered a lot of ground there. Um, number five. Closing bases to protect the environment with Pat Elder, Glenda, Glenda Simino, and Jeannie Toshi Marazani Visconti. Come on up. Okay. Um, basically, our group did what it says on the 10. If you read the description, that's kind of what we did. There were about a dozen of us in the group um, from the United States, Germany, Italy, and Ireland. We formed another sharing circle. We had activists, veterans, journalists, filmmakers and people who were a combination of all of those things. And um, we talked about, each person who was there talked about campaigns in their own country um, to do with stopping or ending the bases there, which is not an easy task. Um, we had uh, Christine from Germany spoke about Ramstein and other bases and the, and the protests were going on there. Um, F. Mutini talked about uh, being underneath the flight path of planes in the middle of the night from Shannon that shouldn't be even in the air because of the no-fly rule between midnight and 6 a.m. And uh, people from Italy talked about the campaign against war against NATO and how they were perceived and treated in the media, for example. Um, everyone had a tremendous amount to contribute. Um, we talked about how many bases there were, and a book was recommended, David Vine's book, Base Nation. Um, evidently, the U.S. has the most, obviously, 80, 80 countries and over 800 bases, with a tilt toward Asia, as, which Obama introduced, there's a string of bases. And when you look at them all on the map, it's very discouraging to look at how big the task is, because there are so many. And they have completely surrounded Russia which no doubt would make Russia feel much more threatened. And not a very healthy, healthy thing to have these bases around. Like one of the most shocking things was presented by Jeannie. Jeannie showed us an eight minute film, which I think everyone should see, about the bases in Italy. And while there's something like officially 59 bases, she counts 110, some of them would be special forces, but it's like the whole country has like measles of bases. <laughs> They're everywhere. And uh, there was one story that she told about, there have been a number of, uh, of massacres in Italy, as we all know, um, like Bologna was one, Bresci. And these massacres, which you know we more or less assumed it was the mafia had something to do with it, she says the explosives came from NATO military bases. And that there were Italian political and masons, politicians and masons who were meeting on the eve of the bomb attacks. And it would appear very strongly that the CIA was actually behind a number of these massacres. Keep people in fear, and they might move to the right, they might be discouraged from taking any kind of action. Um, there's a number of things going on. Um, probably people will be reporting on these, like C&D and Extinction Rebellion have done some cooperation together. 
There's a civil society conference coming up in April 2020 in New York. Um, there's a lot of things that people are involved in. We talked about what can we actually do? What are the key issues? Well, obviously the presence of nuclear weapons in these bases is a very key issue. Um, the electromagnetic pollution from the bases is another. And then of course what, what Pat um, presented so um, eloquently to us, the PFAs. And Pat also handed out, which I think everyone should have a look at, um, investigating military contamination, a 10-step plan. And I think that's on civilianexposure.org, if anyone wants to follow that up. But it's, it's a guide as to how you can actually find out what the pollution is, where it is, um, what kind of effects it has, what sort of laws there are to stop it, if, you know, which can be called into, into effect. Um, I think that we all agreed that it was really important to cooperate together, and it was also stressed that we should uh, follow um, McGuire's suggestion this morning, not talking about either or, but looking very much at and, 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 and working together. We don't all have to agree on everything, as long as we agree on eliminating the basis as, as there, our goal, then that's what's important. Some people have a spiritual point of view, others very agnostic, others very theistic. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we have a common goal that's extremely important to the future of humanity, and um, getting the bases closed down is such a very, very important thing for us to, to work on. Anybody else want to add anything? Okay, nobody wants to do this. That's why I'm doing it. <laughs> okay, there's a point here. Yes, I'm sorry I left that out. That's very important that um, um, some of the Italian participants mentioned the fact that the media distorts everything that we're trying to do. If you're at the end of hashtags, it's close to my heart. So um, I, I also want to say that um, I totally agree that you can have serious conversations using hashtags. We've been doing it on World Beyond War for, for years. and. Um, and that is our hashtag, No War 2019. You can use that to give feedback. You can use that to tell us something that you don't agree with. Um, we want everybody. We want everybody who has anything to say about this conference to let us know. This is actually a way, like an evaluation form, that you can actually give us feedback about how we're doing by posting about it. And um, I think it can be a a, a really vigorous conversation. I'd like every single person in this room to be to be um, using social media to interact with us if you like. And by the way, hashtags are not just Twitter. Hashtags are for Facebook, Instagram, um, and and when you when you use our hashtag, which is for this conference, No War 2019, otherwise World Beyond War. Um, we will see it, and it's a way for you to connect with us, and it's a way for us to connect with you. So please do, and, and please don't hesitate to be serious on social media. <laughs> since you mentioned that. Yes. Yes. Um, okay, um, number three, creating a culture of celebrating peace with Liz Remiswal Hughes and David Swanson. And who is your designated it's reporter? Me, oh, here. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, David and uh, Liz really led us, uh, not by giving a presentation, but uh, by creating a, a workshop where we're all participating in brainstorming for ideas for creating a culture of celebrating peace. Um, so we talked about a really wide range of ideas, um, and it, it was a from a lot of different countries um, uh, in, in various places and things that, that we were doing locally and, and uh, as well as uh, more um, international things. So we talked, um, one of the things we talked about for quite a while um, was that war monuments that exist and are practically ubiquitous everywhere and um, thinking of how to change monuments or create other monuments. And one of the things that we thought about was what, 
what peace monuments are there? And so people were giving various examples. Um, we even passed around a picture, uh, a photo of the huge peace monument in North Korea, which is women's hands coming together, um, sort of in a big, big arch. Um, we talked about um, um, other possibilities like contests around um, uh, essays or our art on peace, peace museums, um, creating or, or helping to create official cultural commissions of peace uh, in municipalities. Um, we talked about um, Esperanto as the language of peace and a way to bring that into to celebrating peace. Um, and we also talked uh, quite a bit about International uh, Peace Day and activities around that. There was uh, someone described uh, Peace Week in the state of Arkansas and the U.S. Um, that's been going for several years and activities that are built around that. Um, and then we focused a bit, uh, David is trying to <laughs> bring us to um, perhaps focus on one idea around celebrating the culture of peace and to actually develop some strategies about that. Uh, we didn't we didn't quite get there, but um, the one we talked about most specifically um, is that of uh, Armistice Day. Um, in the U.S., Armistice Day um, has, uh, which was established in 1918, um, after World War II, you know, morphed into Veterans Day. And so it's become yet another way to uh, glorify war and um, uh, the war dead, as, as someone said, we should really um, try to change the language um, to make it clear that it's not Veterans Day, it's Veterans for War Day. Um, so we talked about a couple specific um, efforts that are being made to create Armistice Day again, either to revise it revive it to replace Veterans Day, um, again, in local areas, or, you know, whether that requires a, sort of a, a whole new day. Um, also talked about a number of ways to um, highlight and focus on peace individuals who are kind of heroes around peace. Um, changing symbols, uh, peace acknowledgments. Um, yeah, and, I, and I, I think that I will end there, but I'll ask if anyone in that group would like to add anything that is important that I may have forgotten. Yeah. We spoke about peace ports. Oh, yes. Peace, peace, peace polls. And it was not just to, cre to celebrate the peace culture, it's to create a peace culture because we live in a war system. So we need to create something anew. Thank you. Anybody else have a good addition? Okay. Oh, yes. Loving for peace. Pardon me? Oh, yes, but one of the other ideas um, that Angie suggested was using laughter yoga to um, <laughs> actually bring people together uh, because what did you say laughter is the shortest distance between people? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up, activism to end the war on Afghanistan with Brian Terrell and Hakeem Young, um, who is the great. Hello. Um, OK, so we uh, were about 16 people, and we formed the Sharing Circle. 
where we were, um, the, yeah, where we had three types of questions uh, with the focus or like with the aim to change our ways of thinking or broaden our ways of thinking. So we, the first one was uh, critical thinking skills. And, um, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. These three skills are used in the Afghan Peace Volunteers organization in Afghanistan, and so we were practicing them in our um, group work. So uh, the first question was, uh, if uh, the US military withdraws completely from Afghanistan, uh, the Taliban or ISIS will take control? Well, this was more of a statement, so. Uh, we broke off into smaller groups and discussed, and of course, none of us have the answer to whether that's true or not, but we had to uh, like look um, for uh, some truth, uh, not truth, but result. Uh, if that happened, would it happen? And uh, yeah, it just caused a discussion, and there was no, uh, we don't know if that would happen. Um, okay, and then the second question um, was creative thinking skills, uh, where um, the question was, what creative solutions can you think of in the Afghan war? So we, um, the, yeah, we were talking in small groups for about five minutes, and uh, some good uh, uh, ideas were bringing the different sides of the fight to the table to talk, um, reparations in Afghanistan from countries uh, who are not involved in the war. Um, yeah. Um, then, what else did we talk about? Um, the last question was relational, uh, yeah, relational thinking skills, which um, should, which are used to learn by relating with nature and every person involved in conflict um, and connect all the dots within a conflict, so the climate change, inequality and war. Um, Hakim shared a personal story of a friend and farmer he knows in Afghanistan. And then the question was, how can we apply relational thinking skills to the Afghan and global refugee and, and the global refugee system. So uh, lots of interesting points came up here and um, thoughts maybe the ecosystem in Afghanistan would regrow if the US backed out of the war and uh, maybe uh, that would lead to Afghanis wanting to go back. Um, yeah, and then the conclusion from Hakim was that the current way we humans are thinking is not working and we need new ones. So that, that was uh, the reason for the three different thought patterns and skills. And then Brian, um, okay, we had an exercise with Brian that was uh, a question after, yeah, a question, what are the connections to the perpetrators in our community? which we discussed as a big group. And um, the main thing that I took down from that was whether to shame the perpetuators or whether to um, educate and open the dialogue with them. Like, so whether to, yeah, to put them into prison and to like take their job away from them if uh, they, or whether to, to open a dialogue and to try and change things in a more peaceful way. Um, yeah, and um, uh, yeah, that's all. That's all I got. Thank you. If anyone in the group wants to share more. All right, you covered a lot of ground there. Um, number five. Closing bases to protect the environment with Pat Elder, Glenda, Glenda Simino, and Jeannie Toshi Marzani Visconti. Come on up. Basically, our group did what it says on the tent, and you read the description, that's kind of what we did. There were about a dozen of us in the group um, from the United States, Germany, Italy, and Ireland. 
We formed another sharing circle. We had activists, veterans, journalists, filmmakers, and people who were a combination of all of those things. And um, we talked about, each person who was there talked about campaigns in their own country um, to do with stopping or ending the bases there, which is not an easy task. Um, we had uh, Christine from Germany spoke about Ramstein and other bases and the, and the protests that were going on there. Um, F. Matini talked about uh, being underneath the flight path of planes in the middle of the night from Shannon that shouldn't be even in the air because of the no-fly rule between midnight and 6 a.m. It's pictures, so it's very important, as you were saying, to develop alternative media of our own and to try to find ways of getting to, to people which are not, because the mass media is one. not going to right carry the fact that the CIA bombed Italy. They're not going to, you know, be interested in explaining to people the danger of the PFA. So we really have to develop our own media and our own ways of getting in touch. And um, starting that process, we've all shared emails to keep in touch with each other because we're all very much involved in, in similar campaigns and issues, either beginning them, about to begin them, or well entrenched in them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this next one is the one I chose to be in after all of these really intense and um, meaningful panels today. I just felt I needed something lighter, so I joined the music it's workshop. It's this was Using Music oh, to Build the this. Movement with Laura Hassler. Okay. And I think uh, Wolfgang and Heinrich, are you the reporters? It was, okay, I wasn't sure if... Were you a reporter too? Or? Come on up. We'll figure it out. Yeah, Give us the song. <laughs> yeah, maybe finally yeah. we have a little bit of time left. We're going to present this song. It was a little bit on a lighter turn. Uh, we found out that we were gender-wise we were the most equal group. Somebody said, you know, uh, Laura. She led us through the the philosophy of music without borders. It's a quite a big organization. I was surprised. I never heard about it. Uh, they are working in Kosovo and Palestine, Rwanda, Burundi. They're trying to uh, bring the music and bring uh, togetherness by music uh, to refugees and people who have been stressed uh, under the circumstances, civil wars and massacres and, and all these uh, uh, warlike situations. And uh, it is all about inclusion, being secure, feeling secure, finding a voice without naming the the problems exactly and uh, liberating yourself by sound and uh, music and uh, we also talked about uh, she, she led us through some examples for example we were trying to uh, sing and uh, uh, touch each other greet each other uh, writing letters by body movement, and uh, so this was all on a, on a very, uh, on a lighter um, mode, I would say, and, and quite nice. And we realized that uh, music is also like uh, playing a very, very big part that cannot be underestimated in the movement, in, in protests, and uh, in all this resistance to, to give it a little bit of relaxing mode and, and, and giving mood to go on and stay together like uh, in the sense of we shall overcome and uh, doing choirs and we, we also gave some examples of, uh, of initiatives we did like uh, at some demonstrations to sing and uh, to do music and what other networks are around in the world and Wolfgang he was also talking about uh, this movement he's doing that is very similar. Yeah. So, also, we said uh, generally uh, we have to give joy, also to do our activities with joy. And we said in the Western culture, we think uh, culture and music is some, some, uh, something out of us, not of our, part of our per uh, personality. But she thinks in many cultures it's still part that they sing in the day and have uh, joy, that we can, can learn a lot of those who, who did not lose uh, uh, this uh, com commercializing culture, 
yeah, just as a, as a good to, to sell and to produce for others, but for, them, for themselves. Yeah, we have uh, brought one example. In Germany, uh, we have many parts where people are not used to foreigners. And they are still used as scapegoat, naturally uh, promoted by our media, that they are responsible for their crisis and so on. And uh, we go in areas where they have never personal contact with a dark-skinned uh, person. We have formed a group called Black and White, and I go with uh, Africans, first only refugees, we organized it, and I told them why they attacked you in Germany is many have no idea what's going on in your home countries, what are the reasons that you are here. Secondly, uh, they have prejudice, so have even fear, and out of this come aggression. So we formed a group and go with uh, music. Even in those towns, and sometimes it's very cold, when we come inside, they see us, and then we make music with them, and then we make drumming with them and dancing, but also combine it with presentations uh, about the background, why people flee, and what is our future about human rights declaration, try to mobilize them, that we can only survive as one mankind, to give this philosophy, and it works specially because this mu music opens the hearts and uh, opens the people that they even listen to you to the harder facts. So I think this music is, is very important for us uh, to come forward and combine our movement with joy. We have to learn it, you know, many of us are not used to it, but it can be a big tool. Uh, yes. I think we are performing. Yeah, where, where oh, somebody else is coming up. Hi, um, um, okay. I'm adding a few things. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm from Okinawa, um, now part of Japan, but we used to be an independent country. So there is a, uh, some problem lies there. Uh, uh, current situation, Japan, America, and then Okinawa, the situation we have. Um, Big protests about the um, new uh, US military base in Enoko. So, um, after the war, Second World War, uh, Okinawa was contained in a camp, and uh, while America was making lots and lots of military bases, uh, what uh, brought us back to life was music. And the same as in here, I live in Ireland at the moment. Um, there is a music, always, united people. That was the identity. And I heard about um, Rose's um, book. Uh, I, I'm a musician and I'm a music teacher and have choirs. Um, especially, I'm interested in um, educating young people about diversity, different culture, different people, uh, through music, without preaching. So, so this was very interesting. Um, workshop for me. I have two Syrian girls in my choir too and try to combine lots of different type of music and also uh, through the uh, workshop today we try to uh, free ourselves, express improvisation so that kind of brings a uh, lost voice like quite often those people even in conflict, a conflict area or refugees, they lose their voice, literally, uh, what to say or what to, their culture had offered music uh, or another type of expression, <coughs> dancing included. So that kind of music, bring music to this without border uh, movement is bringing our voice back. And also, we, for those people who are in that situation, uh, reminding them, themselves the culture they had, um, you know, uh, offering that culture to us as well, including the like, Western culture, the Western world. So it's, we are not victims. We are also, we, can, we have lots of things to give and um, broaden your view of the world. So that's, we were um, witnessing again how we can create, inspire people. 
and not giving the we were not only giving but receiving both that. So that was the our workshop. Yeah, <laughs> so anybody want to perform? <laughs> So, uh, musicians. Yeah. Who was your? Who was your? Everyone. Round here. Uh, we should overcome. Maybe you should sing together. Uh, we should overcome. Yeah. No, I think we should do the music. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, again, you know, we have sort of different music. We have all of us. <laughs> it does. Yeah, and then uh, shall, shall I say a little bit about how this yeah. happened? Shall I explain a little bit how we were yeah. how we were doing this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, just to explain a little bit about the exercise that produced this um, composition that you're about to hear. Uh, so this was an exercise about creativity. And it was an exercise about inclusion and about teamwork and cooperation. We're, we're, we're um, going to be embarrassed, eh? Yeah. It's yeah. Right. That's not going to be embarrassed. Okay. <laughs> so what we did was uh, everybody took a paper and folded it in four pieces. And I asked everybody to think of one small sound and to draw that sound in one quarter of the paper. And everybody made a sound. It might be just like whoop, whoop or oh, or whatever and yeah you can show yeah so each person had a sound a couple of people let us hear their sounds then the next part was to draw three variations of that sound so then you had four different um, sounds on your paper and the next step was to divide into groups of four or five people and to take these bits of a score, these sounds, and to create a piece together based on those sounds. So we had, th we had three groups, and each group created something, and in some groups a kind of leader or coordinator emerged, and they all worked in different ways, and then we came and performed for each other. The point was that everything was fine that people were making music without feeling put on the spot. They were doing it together. It is a way of, um, of encouraging the creative process, which releases a lot of things that are often frozen when you're in a situation where uh, you're living in a stressed environment, you could say, or you have had uh, traumatic experiences. Uh, things shut down. So this was a way of, of just experimenting with this particular technique, which is one of the ones that we use in our projects in Musicians Without Borders. I believe this is going to be an improvisation based on those three improvisations. And um, are you going to sort of guide it, or are you? Everybody, so everybody's going to use the sounds that they created, and this will be a totally original piece, and this is the world premiere. <laughs> We're missing a few people, uh, very importantly, uh, percussion, but... Um, and we're putting all the yeah, groups yeah, together, which yeah, is total yeah. chaos, but we'll have yeah. <laughs> See what ha happens. Yeah. First, yeah. first performance, even for ourselves. Yeah. 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 Oh, <laughs> 
is going to be a recap of this conference. So, um, since you've all been here, I just want to make sure once we release this episode, which will be in a couple of weeks, um, we do one a month. Um, I hope you'll all check it out. We've done eight episodes so far, so I just wanted to mention that. And then finally, um, there is a reservation for 30 people at the res restaurant about uh, 100 meters that way, right? Off the bone, yeah. Um, so you're, you're all invited, just come on down. It, it looks like way more than 30 people here, so if everybody shows up, that's their problem. Um, and I think that's it. We're meeting at back here for the movie, and then 9 a.m. tomorrow for another cool day. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Not afraid.